Welcome to Thoughtfully Mindless. My guest in this episode is Lars Mapstead. Lars is a tech entrepreneur, a road racing enthusiast, and 2024 Libertarian candidate for President of the United States of America. In this conversation, we talk about the rigged political system, the destruction caused by central banking, the war on drugs, and more. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. And with that, let's welcome Lars. Lars, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, we're just going to dive right into it. Why don't you uh, explain a little bit about your uh, your campaign slogan, Unrig the System. I already align with a lot of it. I think the system is very rigged and we can yeah. dive into that. But why don't you elaborate on it for people who are listening? Yeah, well, you know, we were really trying to find a campaign slogan that resonated with um, essentially like common sense solutions for America, uh, things that were had integrity and and were fair. That was kind of like what we were kind of aiming for. And we really pushed around a lot of different ideas. And and uh, I was I was driving back from Porkfest up in New Hampshire, and you know we knew that the election system was rigged. And but I thought you can't really run a whole campaign on unrig the election system. But then as the more I thought about it, the more we we would say stuff and then we'd be like, oh, well, that's a rig system. The economy is a rig system or we you know almost joking, right? Like healthcare is a rig system or criminal justice is a rig system. And so once we realized that m most of the things that we interact with with government in some way, shape or form is rigged. Um, and then I realized that when I say to people, you know, you know, the system is rigged, that pops something into their mind. Like, I don't even have to tell them what system is rigged for them, right? They've experienced some kind of like uh, interaction with government that wasn't um, as good as it could be. And, and so, and sometimes it could be, you know, really poor. And so, and so unrigged the system is simply, uh, we took the five most important things uh, from polling that Americans are concerned about during this election cycle. And, and uh, so that's, that's what we really focused on. Our policy team focused on for almost nine months, crafting policy. Uh, so this isn't just uh, simple slogans. This is actual policy that we have with white papers on exactly what we're going to do to unrig the system for, for people. So elections are definitely rigged. Um, <laughs> and the degree to which they're rigged can be debated by Yep. It's interesting because the two parties, they're rigged depending on what they're, if they won, right? But right, they are, right, right. but they yeah. are absolutely rigged. They only, the, the duopoly only cares about free and fair elections uh, as long, as long as it's benefiting them. As soon as it's against them, then they cry foul and say, you know, the system is rigged. And so, you know, when I say the system, the election system is rigged, it's not for the reason that most people think, Okay. Uh, it's it's literally that we are foisted uh, candidates that we have to choose from. We we have the illusion of choice in America, and that's one of the big reasons why I was you know I'm running for president is I wanted to offer more choices to people. I wanted to offer another option than than what we you know get all the time, which is like, I, you know, I, I voted for Bush and Clinton, Bush and Clinton, not that I voted for them because I, I didn't vote for either of them, but um, you know, it, it, that's what we were forced upon, you know, now we have Trump and, uh, and Biden, Trump and Biden. And I, I half joking said that uh, 2028 is going to be Hunter Biden versus Jared Kushner. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't surprise me at this point. Uh, the elections are rigged beyond what most people typically talk about in the Currently, in 1992, Ross Perot made some waves and people called him a spoiler for the Republicans. And since then, they changed the system. So you have to poll at 15 percent to get on the debate stage. And a lot of these polls might not even include you as a third party right. candidate. So <laughs> right. the system is absolutely rigged yeah. to keep people like you out. How do you combat that to actually make waves in this and and potentially win the yeah so i mean we're you know we're we live in a good age of of social media of you know ability to reach more people than you've ever reached before you know it's like when you know before television you know the presidents would you know go to newspapers and maybe they do a train whistle stop they call them whistle stops because they just get on the train and they'd stop at each place and then do a stump speech at the train station and then get on the train and go to the next place right so we have the ability like I'm literally reaching half a million people a day right now on Twitter through advertising and that's every day. And so it's like, 
yeah, we can't be in the debates, but I've already done probably 10 debates with, you know, libertarian candidates. I'm about to do a big debate in New York uh, for free and equal that I qualified for. That will be with, uh, with a bunch uh, with like um, Cornell West and Jill Stein and, and, you know, another libertarian candidate. So that'll be good and it'll be televised and broadcast. So I think that it's, you know, I don't even know if they'll actually have a debate between Trump and Biden this time. Like they might even just skip it all together. Right. So, um, I don't think it's as important, right? But the the thing that is important is the suppression by social media of third party candidates, right? Of of independent candidates, because like right now on Facebook, um, you know, I can watch them suppress certain uh, posts that I make. If I mention certain words, like they'll sh- I have like forty five thousand fans, and normally I get twenty or thirty thousand reach on on a post, and if I put certain words in there, it'll, they'll show up to fifty or sixty people. If I post memes, they'll show it to everybody. If I post something serious that's policy related, they show it to 50 people. So it's like, it's really hard to get your message out there except for through like satire almost is is how I found the best way to get message out there right now, unfortunately. Yeah, well, X is one of the few platforms that's not doing that so much. It's not so much, but, but they have their own suppression. Like if you mention Facebook, uh, you know, they'll ban that. They'll they'll suppress it. If you me- if you mention Rumble or some other platform that's going to take them away from from X, they'll they'll nerf it into the ground. And, you know, I see other political pages getting, you know, p- punished pretty hardly, you know, pr- pr- pretty hard. Yeah. As far as uh, attracting voters, I think uh, conservatives tend to align a little bit more with libertarian values, but Democrats, traditional Democrats might be more opposed to it because they see more value in social programs, which I know you're not against necessarily. Um, How do you attract those voters who are under the false belief that government actually helps people? Yeah, I I think, you know, like one interesting thing is I I post on Robert Reich's page a lot. Uh, And so, you know, for a long time, I was kind of antagonistic and I still am occasionally, but sometimes I try to use sort of the left's words to kind of show them where they're at. So for for instance, one of the big things that I believe is that the Federal Reserve is responsible for income and wealth inequality. Uh, you know, and and the left thinks that it's corporations, which is sort of true, but not really, because what it is is the government gives the money um to the banks, the banking cartel through the Federal Reserve, and then the banks give that to the corporations. So if you want to end wealth and income inequality, you have to start at the top of the banking cartel, which is the Federal Reserve. And they, you know they've stolen $34 trillion from American citizens. So that's kind of a, a thing that I push. And then people are like, oh, and so and but I, and I push that um, with like abolishing the income tax, because I like there's a lot of times like today they were talking about how um, you know, big corporations have all this money and the little working guy doesn't get anything and that sort of thing. And, and that's true. But what, what my plan would be is to make all citizens asset holders, right? If we like abolish the income tax and we let people keep a hundred percent of their paycheck, they would have more money to invest in things like the stock market, you know, cause they're saying, well, they, these guys never get to benefit from the corporate gains, right? Well, the, the reason they don't is because they're not asset holders. And it would be great if we made everybody an asset holder because then all Americans would be aligned at making the profits of the country go up, right? Like if everybody had a stake in, in, in business and in, in the financial success of America, uh, that would be huge, right? So I think that that's one thing. So I push that. And then the other thing that I talk about is, you know, the left really doesn't like uh, the loopholes in the tax code. They feel like the rich don't pay their fair share, right? And so I, I often say, well, let's just end all the loopholes altogether by abolishing the tax code. And, you know, because the tax code is used by Congress to bro out those corporations that they don't like, to grant favors to their political elites, right? So if you are a regular working person, you know, you should not want the income tax because the income tax is completely unfair. It has 87,000 pages of unfairness in it, right? So so I push that. And I think, uh, you know, s- sometimes it breaks through. Sometimes people get it, right? But there's also like a lot of things you can you can talk to those people about where where it hits them right at home, which is like our criminal justice system being completely rigged. 
you know, um, about ending the war on drugs, the failed war on drugs that we've had for 50 years, where more people are doing drugs today than ever before, right? Because we basically created a cartel, uh, all the cartels, and their job is to get people hooked on drugs, right? And so, I mean, the government just completely failed there. Criminal justice system is completely broken. We have, you know, multi tiers of justice where if you're, if you have money and if you're well connected, then the law doesn't apply to you. Um, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, if you, if you, doesn't matter if you have money or not money, if you do something bad, you should, you know, you should be make a, uh, atonement for that kind of a thing. So those are a couple things that, you know, that the left likes that we are, we totally agree on. Uh, you know, I believe that like, for instance, um, with, uh, you know, like your own personal health issues and your own personal, um, preferences, as long as you're not harming other people, you should essentially be able to do whatever you want. So, you know, for example, gay marriage, I, you know, I don't care if you're gay and get married. It doesn't matter to me, right? Like I, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't harm me at all. So I think in a lot of those cases we get, um, you know, we, we are aligned with the left on a lot of the social issues. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, your position on gay marriage, I think, uh, the other thing you thought about going with before you decided to unrig the system was uh, live and let live, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes along really well with that. I am completely in agreement with you on the Federal Reserve and central banking. I, I believe central banking causes the rat race that we see because all of the people with assets, they're fine when we have inflation, but all the people who only have money that they're saving up for their first house or, yep. or some other asset, they're yep. completely screwed because the value is diminishing faster than they can save up. So, yeah, I saw, I saw an interesting thing the other day where a guy was, um, he was showing that the, um, the rate of money supply versus the S and P 500. And he was basically saying that even the S and P 500 barely outpaces the money supply. And that if you're not beating the money supply, you're going backwards, even if you have money, right? Which is which was kind of an interesting thing. But totally, if you if you were saving up for a house and you have a hundred grand and then suddenly the house doubles in price, uh, you have to double your down payment. And to get another hundred grand is, you know, is a lot of it's almost a long shot for most people, right? Like the the idea of saving up a hundred thousand. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I, I grew up with uh, an, an outhouse and no electricity literally on government welfare. And the th the I remember there was a certain point where I was making $2,000 a month and I thought, oh man, I'm rich. I've, I've, I've arrived, I finally arrived, baby. I'm making two whole thousand dollars a month. Right. And so, um, I, you know, the idea of saving a hundred thousand dollars, that's hilarious to most people, right? Like it's just completely out of reach. Right. And so, um, you know, that's why I would like to keep more money in people's pockets. And the other thing that I'm really working on is kind of an energy race to vastly reduce the cost of energy for America uh, because everything that we touch, everything in our economy is tied to energy. Uh, the cost is embedded in everything in the clothes you're wearing and the microphone in front of you, that sort of thing. And if we were able to like say, cut the energy cost in half, uh, that would be a huge boom to our economy. It would drive a lot of new jobs. Um, companies would be running to America to, to you know, lay claim to the cheap energy that we have. So I'm, I'm looking at, a, I have a whole energy policy basically kind of akin to the space race where we, we, where we race to get a man on the moon. Right now we're racing against China and Russia and a couple of other countries to get the cheapest energy possible. And whoever gets that cheap energy first will really dominate economically for decades, maybe even a century to come. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you touched on justice uh, being rigged, and I just released an interview about, uh, I don't know if you know her name, but Ellen Greenberg, she was killed uh, in 2011, and it appears that some pretty severe corruption is involved in keeping her death ruled a suicide. Medical mm -hmm. examiners are a weak point in our justice system. Uh, how do you combat that how do you combat the justice system because it it seems like a rogue entity at this point and they prioritize going after political issues more than they care about actual justice and then you have cities like new york and stuff like that where people commit heinous crimes and then are released the next day yeah yeah, you know, at the federal level is the only thing that the president really has control over. So I couldn't really do anything about, you know, state issues or local issues. But 
Uh, one thing that, you know, obviously, I, like I said, ending the failed war on drugs would be a key priority there. Uh, I think that that puts a lot of people in jail that shouldn't be in jail for victimless crime, for, you know, crimes that are just for, you know, doing whatever you want to do in your own house or whatever. Um, but we can also, like, there's a thing called the Plum Book, which is 7,000 positions that the president gets to appoint. And under that 7,000 positions, they all have, you know, people working underneath that. So it's like 50,000 people that he essentially gets to appoint. And so uh, I would work to basically reduce the power of the president over, over the time that I was in the pre presidential cabinet by getting rid of these 7,000 positions. And uh, they include, you know, all kinds of alphabet departments and stuff. If you don't have a head of the alphabet department, it's going to be hard for it to operate. And so I, I kind of say if, uh, you know, if the if the peace is needed, then Congress should write a law to create the peace, not give it to the president to just like, you know, have at his whim kind of a thing. And so that would go a long way to cutting things down. And then the president can uh, tell the Justice Department the things that they want to prioritize. Right. So like I would definitely not be prioritizing drugs uh, and, and, you know, that sort of thing. And I would be prioritizing like harsh, like really hard crimes, right? More. Um, I think that's where we need to put our focus on. Uh, and then, you know, in, in any way that I can reduce uh, the amount of federal justice that we have, the better, in my opinion, because I feel like we really don't need as much federal justice as we have. Like, it should really be reserved for uh, more rare cases than, you know, the, the long arm of the law and, like, sticking its nose into every little piece of business around America. We have sheriffs and we have police and they can handle you know 99.9 .9 of the stuff that goes on right i feel like the the federal justice department should be about holding corrupt local uh uh justice people you know you know when they do something bad that's when the federal government should come in and be like well this this is a corrupt uh you know local agency and we should take care of that that would be a better use in my opinion of the justice department is policing the police I mean, not not that the police guard the hen house very well. <laughs> I mean, the war on drugs is ridiculous. And we create with our war on drugs policy, we create the cartels. I think that yep. is absolutely true. Yeah. If you Which, make something illegal, people who are willing to break the law for money will do it. Yeah. And it, not only that, but if you're if you hand somebody a business and they're and they have a monopoly on that business. You know, as a business person, I know that my goal was to get as many people buying my service or product as I possibly could, right? So you hand these cartels a monopoly and then they're like, oh, we can grow our business by getting people hooked on drugs, right? And so so it's like, and, and so there's literally this incentive to like harm people and get people hooked on drugs. And, and we created that. And that, you saw that with prohibition with alcohol, right? It just doesn't work. It, it's, it's um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, no, you can't legalize drugs because everybody would be on drugs. And, and I say, well, so if, if heroin was legal tomorrow, would you run out and start shooting up? No, no. Like the answer is always no. Right. And so I'm like, it's not going to create more. It's like when we legalized marijuana in a bunch of states, did, you know, did millions and millions of more people start smoking marijuana every day? No, it just made it so that the people that were weren't criminals. And in fact, I argue that because it's no longer taboo, a lot of people won't even start it up because it's like a lot of kids just pick up things because they're rebellious and they're like, oh, I can't do that. I'm doing that. Right. But if you can do it, then it's like, oh, I don't really care about that. I'll find something else to be rebellious about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as someone who I've I've taken a few drugs and uh, I've rejected many drugs, too, and I knew what I wanted to take and I knew what I didn't want to take. And the ability to have those at my disposal didn't change the decision. It was just, yeah. And you know, I think a lot of people then say, Oh, well, Lars, you're a libertarian. So you're just for, you know, everybody doing drugs. Um, but the truth is, is I got sober when I was 17 because I did way too many drugs as a youth. And, uh, and I don't, you know, I've been sober for 37 years now. Uh, and I've helped tens of thousands of people recover from drugs and alcohol, uh, over, over the time that I've been sober. So I, you know, it's not about like, having a free for all drug addict society. It's just about not punishing people, um, especially because alcoholism and drug addiction is, is a disease in my opinion. And so you're literally punishing people for like having cancer. And can you imagine as like, we put everybody that had cancer in jail 
you can't, you're, oh, you're a bad person. You have cancer. Like that would be ridiculous. Right. So we need to like offer treatment, offer help and offer support to, for people to not necessarily uh, get hooked on, you know, hard drugs because it is, it is, you know, things are addictive. And, and once you get on them, sometimes it's, you know, if you have the right personality, it's almost impossible to quit. Yeah. I mean, you put somebody who smokes marijuana in jail with rapists and, and murderers, and they're going to come out a very different person. Yes. So, and, yes. and making drugs legal doesn't mean that the crimes that are committed around drugs are then legal. Correct. A hundred percent correct. And, and that, you know, that's, that's a lot of the same thing with like homelessness and with drugs is that I, I, you know, I struggled with the homelessness idea for a long time. And what I realized for me personally was I don't care if people are homeless and I don't care. I mean, obviously I don't want people to be homeless, but if you are homeless, it's not a burden on me. Um, it's just when you start committing crime that I care. Like if you want to sleep in the park, sleep in the park, you know, it's like, uh, but if you are like totally destroying the environment or you're like causing harm to, you know, other people, then you need to be held accountable for that kind of measure. Right. So it's uh it's an interesting thing, but I, I feel like people need to be held accountable if they're harming other people. Absolutely. Um, you touched on this, but you said you wouldn't elect or nominate heads of several departments. You said you'd be the president of no, I, I believe I heard yep. you say in another interview. Yeah. Are there positions that you definitely would nominate for and which would those positions be? Oh, um, boy, with 7,000 to choose from, it's a, that's a, it's a good laundry list. Uh, you know, I think honestly, I really like to try not filling any of them and see what breaks and see like just a little bit of chaos, I think wouldn't be bad because, it, and the reason I even got this idea was, uh, when Trump got elected, I guess maybe he wasn't expecting to get elected or he just wasn't a career politician or what, but he didn't appoint a bunch of those positions, like almost a year in, there were still positions that hadn't been filled, right? And I remember hearing the talking heads complaining, they're like, oh, this hasn't been filled and the government's not working properly. And I'm like, oh, well, that sounds really good to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> that sounds great. So, and, you know, and, and then, you know, Congress was complaining about it. And I'm like, well, Congress, you have the authority to write, you know, the power of the purse. If you feel like there needs to be an agency, create the agency. Right. Like, I mean, I mean, it's that simple. I think that Congress has given the president way too much power and partly because they don't want to do their job. It's easier to, like, put it all on the president and then blame the president than it is to, um, you know, to. To do their own job kind of a thing. Yeah, we touched on the Federal Reserve and both of us are against that. Do you have a position on Bitcoin? Because many people who are pro Bitcoin want that to be the currency you know or yeah. the standard at least in the future yeah i yeah i've uh i've been in bitcoin and cryptocurrency probably since around 2017 or 16 or something like that so it's been a long time i have a lot of investments in uh blockchain technology i'm a huge fan of it i'm a huge fan of DeFi. i feel like that would go a long way to fixing uh, a lot of the problems that we have is allowing people to have these alternative currencies and, um, you know, having the central government, especially now that they're looking into central bank digital currencies where the government controls every transaction and can monitor every transaction. That's that's a, a hell for a libertarian. <laughs> like that's a, that's a hellish world. So I would be very much against central bank digital currencies and very much in favor of uh, all kinds of alternative options for uh, transacting uh, goods and services. As president, you would be responsible for uh, foreign policy and two of the, I know you're anti-war and I love that because I'm anti-war is, war is horrible. Yeah. And, uh, but we have several wars going on right now. Uh, whether people want to admit that we're involved or not, we have Israel, Palestine, yeah. and we have Ukraine and potentially Iran on yeah. The brink of war how yeah, would you yeah. navigate those waters yeah unfortunately you know we've been at war all my life 
we've been in some kind of conflict since the day I was born, right? Like uh, I was born in 69 and we were just getting out of uh, Vietnam War and, um, you know, and then we went into, you know, Iraq and, um, you know, Afghanistan and on and on and on and on. And so unfortunately, we do live in that world where there's already predetermined activities going on. And if you come into the presidency, you're not going to wave a magic wand and make them all disappear overnight. Right. So I think um, my grandfather was a lieutenant colonel in the in the army and he served in both uh, Korea and Vietnam. And I, when I was discussing with him about uh, military stuff, you know, he said the best way that you can um, honor our veterans um, is to not create any more of them. Right. And so I think that we have to be more of peacemaker uh, than we are at policing the world. Like we we can't even police Chicago or California or San Francisco. How are we supposed to be the police of the world, right? So um, I feel like that's a, another failure of ours and that we keep pushing our uh, agenda around the world. And it, it causes animosity. Every time we interfere in another country's uh, outcomes, you know, we're picking sides, we're picking winners and losers, and some the losers are going to hate us forever. And then we, we tend to flip flop. And it's just it's just bad. So, you know, I'm always on the side of less death. That's the number one, like guiding light for me is, uh, is that and you know, I've always been really pissed off that my tax dollars are buying bombs that are killing kids in faraway lands. That's, uh, that's atrocious to me, right? So, um, yeah, you know, Obviously, just trying to get more peaceful solutions than running in, you know, with guns blazing and taking out people all over the world is it seems like a much better path. Uh, and and I think that part of that is about enhancing people's lives all over the world, not necessarily with financial aid or that sort of thing, but by being a, a good steward of our own uh, country and our own economy. Uh, you know, our economy lifts up all boats around the world. If we're doing really good, other countries benefit. If we if we're doing really bad economically, other countries are poor. And when people are have money and they have food on their table and they have a roof over their head, they're much less likely to be pissed off and killing each other. Right. So so that's a little bit of that. Yeah. You touched on uh, people blame corporations for the issues with money and stuff. And I, I just want to touch on that. Like, I think everything you can blame on corporations you can really blame on government because government enables it like all the killing your competition and everything by means that we don't like that's all caused by government because there's backroom deals going on and stuff like that so yep yeah and, and even just taxes right like if 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 a government gives one corporation a giant tax break um, for, you know, building a new facility or bringing jobs to an area or whatever, they are picking a winner there and they're picking losers, you know, elsewhere. And so, you know, the, we don't have free market capitalism. We have full crony capitalism where the government is in bed with the corporations. And so I would like to reduce that as much as possible across the board. Obviously, we want regulations to make sure that there aren't bad actors and that, you know, they're not destroying the the air and the water that we have and that sort of thing. But, you know, um, other than that, I feel like nanny government doesn't need to be involved in every single transaction that we have. I, I just was, I just posted on something. I think Biden was, um, talking about just really getting in the nitty gritty micromanaging companies and their profits and how they can profit and how much they can profit and that sort of thing. And, and I just thought, you know, we don't need government involved in every transaction that we do. And then it hit me. We have government in every transaction we do through taxation. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I started this as a business last year and I have a couple other things going on and uh, I'm not a man of like excessive means by any stretch of the imagination and i can say for sure that the government makes it very hard for small business owners to yes. operate and succeed 100 percent, especially like if you uh if you don't have a job healthcare uh if you're an independent contractor or a you know sole proprietor or even a like a small business of three or four or five people healthcare is a huge issue uh it's really hard to get insurance the insurance is overly expensive the, the, you know the government favors you to be a worker inside a corporation 
uh, far over you being your own boss and, and, and doing your, you know, making your own way in life. And so I feel like that's, that's one of the areas where our healthcare policy tries to like level that for gig economy workers. I'm a huge fan of gig economy. If you want to like be an Uber driver or you want to be a door dasher or, you know, any of these kind of things that are out there, Airbnbs, I feel like we should be embracing that because that is innovation. That is really like cutting edge stuff. And it's, it's, um, disrupting all kinds of, you know, industries. And I feel like we should embrace, embrace that rather than uh, letting the monopolies hold all the power. Yeah. Yeah. Healthcare is a huge thing. I can spend $10,000 a year to get healthcare or not healthcare insurance. I can <laughs> spend 10 grand a year to get insurance. And then I've never spent 10 grand on healthcare in a right. year in my life. So, right. Well, it's, it's just a tax, essentially. You're paying $10,000 in order to cover some other people that that are maybe have harder uh, issues or whatever. But you, you're forced to take it because if you don't have it, then you're completely wiped out financially, right? So it's, it's almost like you don't really have a choice. You're like forced into the situation. So if, if you don't have any money, then, you know, that sort of goes away because the government gives you free healthcare, right? But if you're like, it's really hard to be the guy that's like a sole proprietor or four or five, you know, people working. And that's the number one job driver of America is small business, right? So we really hamper the small business with our healthcare system. And it's, uh, you know, the, the government has just granted monopolies to the pharmaceutical companies, to the insurance companies and to the big health conglomerates. And they don't have any, um, competition at all. And that's the competition is the only thing that's going to drive down pricing. So my uh, policies around healthcare are all around transparency, uh, allowing you to choose who you want to have, you know, so that you have choices. And and because if you don't have choice, um, you don't have competition, just like our election system, right? It's like, uh, if, if you don't have choice, and you have to have that competition to drive down the price. It's the same as our education system and on our uh, all the education loans, we don't have any competition because the government is the is the loan shark, right? Um, and so we've, and then it just drives up the cost of education. I say that um, one of my things I love to say is that uh, government breeds mediocrity and the more government we have, the more mediocre we become. I would agree with that. The last question I have is about fear. Fear is something that the, the duopoly has a stranglehold of. They use it unfortunately, to great effect to control voters. How do you combat that with a reasonable message? How do you break through that fear yeah. narrative that both parties are using all the time and really get your message heard and understood? Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I was, uh, I was in Arizona a few weeks back at a libertarian convention and there was a sheriff there who's an anarchist and he was a speaker at the convention and uh, he had this whole diatribe about how the left and the right use um, uh, guilt to and guilt and like fear of um, being singled out to keep you all in line. So, for instance, what he, he this was a thing that he said: if you say you're pro gun, uh, the answer is you hate children and want them to die. Right. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And then he gave like six or seven examples. And I was like, oh, and you don't want to be the guy that's like the kid killer, obviously. Right. And so you so you shy away. You're like, oh, crap, I can't really be for this because it's for, you know, they they're nailing me with killing kids. And obviously you don't want to kill kids. You don't want any kids to be harmed. It's ridiculous. But when they say that. And then the rest of society is like looking at you, right? You're like, oh, I don't want to be labeled that, right? And so they get everybody to kind of get in line. Uh, I think, you know, it comes down to that we use government to force our will and our opinions on other groups of people. And that's what the left and right are all about. They get in power and then they try to use the government to coerce the other side into behaving the way that they want. And that leads to all kinds of uh, animosity and anger. And I think that's why we saw the BLM riots and we saw the January 6th stuff is because everybody on all sides feels like the government is being used against them uh, and that they're not able to live their life freely, right? And so I think that that's the message that I'm trying to send to people is that it doesn't matter if you're left or right, 
Um, it matters if you believe that the government has your best interest in hand and that the government knows how to run your life better than you do. If you believe that, then keep going for government. If you believe that you know how to run your life better than the government does, then we need to do something about that, right? We need to stop forcing our moral judgment on other people, on other groups of people, and just live and let live. And I love that, uh, you know, that slogan. It's, it's one that I definitely, you know, uh, put into effect in my life for sure. Uh, lastly, I want to hand the mic over to you to tell listeners how they can find you, how they can support you, all that. But I also usually ask people about books that you recommend, any books that you find influential. So feel free to share that and then uh, tell listeners how they can learn more about you and find you. Yeah, awesome. Well, I've been reading a lot of... Um you know, a lot of the various libertarian books, because I hadn't really been steeped in libertarian books. I was just, uh, you know, I came through uh, a quiz on online. That's how I became a libertarian, right? And so I hadn't, I wasn't like a, a studious libertarian, so to speak. So I've been reading a lot of, uh, of those books, a Hayek and, you know, some Ron Paul books and, um, you know, anatomy of the state and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, and then if you want to find me on social media, that's that's where people can find me the most. It's uh, on Twitter or X. I'm at Libertarian Lars on uh, Facebook. Just look up Lars for president. And then I have a bunch of the other little social medias. And then if you want to look at my policies, uh, Lars24.com is my website. And we have all the policies with the white papers. And of course, you can donate to our campaign or sign up to volunteer to, you know, to help. We're going to be doing a lot of phone calling and a lot of texting over the next few months. And we need people who can do that. Or if you happen to be a libertarian um, and going to Washington, D.C. to be a delegate, that's how I become the nominee for the party. So uh, I need people to show up in Washington, D.C. for me to, to nominate me. When is the uh, nomination? It's uh, it, uh, Memorial Day week in uh, Washington, D.C. Okay, awesome. Well, Lars, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, I welcome you to leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And you can find me on X or Twitter at RDTM Podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. You can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique clothing designs that are fractal and animal inspired. I'll also put an Amazon affiliate link in the description below. You can click on that link before making an Amazon purchase and some commission will go to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen today. That's it for this episode. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.